Hi, I'm Susan Bandes, architectural historian from Michigan, and you are listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. I'm George Smart. Nowhere in the world celebrates modernism better than Palm Springs, California. Every February, they have a huge architecture and design festival called Modernism Week, which actually lasts 11 days. Modernism Week is a dazzling spectacle of art, architecture, movies, martinis, parties, and things that you can do at night that you really couldn't do other places, like time travel. You can go back in time to this 1950s-era nightclub called Melvin's, where there's a piano player over in the corner, and it's kind of a dark bar, and everybody's drinking these finely crafted cocktails, and you feel like Frank Sinatra could just walk into the room at any moment. If you are into mid-century modern, this is the peak of all the architecture we love, an event not to be missed. And we were there talking with nearly all the keynote speakers, authors, and special guests. And I'm Tom Guild. I came with George to Modernism Week because he he couldn't keep me off the airplane <laughs> after hearing about it for so many years. And this year, I got to take the almost vertical climb up the mountain to Frey House 2, mm. this house that Albert Frey built for himself it's not very big. It's maybe a thousand square maybe, feet. Maybe if that. And it's it's on the side of a of a rock with a pool and a view to die for. 180, 200 degrees all around Palm yep. Springs. You can see the airport. You can see all the mountains. You can see the Pacific Ocean. Well, I guess if you look hard enough. <laughs> I don't think you can't see the ocean from up there, can you, Tom? No. Okay. You can't. <laughs> I lied. Support for U.S. Modernist Radio comes from Realtor Angela Roll, your special real estate agent for bringing modernist design expertise to buyers and sellers. Reach Angela at AngelaRoll.com, that's R-O-E-H-L, or 919-995-0550. Music is an important part of Modernism Week, too. There's always good music playing in a Modernist House tour. And today, George talks with singer-songwriter A.J. Lambert, who just released a debut album and performed a rave reviews at Modernism Week. Plus, Joan and Gary Gand of the Gand Band, owners of one of the sweetest mid-century houses in Palm Springs, and they're known across the Coachella Valley for their swinging Chicago-inspired blues and jazz tunes. My crack research team yes. has, been, has been working uh -huh. on night and day. And we thought we'd try something different for this interview. Good. So, I'm going to show you something. Okay. And what we're going to try to do, we're going to play a little game. Okay. We're going to try not to say this word. Okay. For as long as possible. Are you ready? Yes. Are you ready? Here we uh -huh. go. All right. So, we're not going to say this word for as long as possible during I the interview. I can manage that. Can you do that? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I listened to your album. Okay. And it's, it's not glamorous. Okay. But it is like really profound and emotional and you can hear that there's this like real life you have had. Yeah. Yeah. I that's great. <laughs> um that's kind of uh what the intent was. I mean, I hope. I mean, let's start with the cover, okay. which is not typical. You're not lounging against a grand piano somewhere. You are walking on a power line, yeah. I think, up in the air, yeah. doing a little balancing act. Yeah. There's a metaphor there somewhere, right? For Well, you know, the record's called Careful You, and there's no comma. It's not Careful <laughs> You. Yeah, be careful. It's not that. It's Careful You. Like, the you are the careful person. You're okay. careful. And so it's kind of, to me, about... I mean, the song Careful You, to me, is about the kind of high wire act that it takes to, to risk your heart for stuff. Yeah. So that's kind of what that cover is about too. Is that a risk for, for you? Is that a risk for love? Is that a risk for your music? What are you, 
most get getting on the wire about lately? I mean everything. <laughs> I'm I'm at heart terrified of everything and I <laughs> but I but I learn to I just kind of act as if it's not the case. Yeah. In everything. How do you do that? That would be a great thing to learn. I just I kind of grew up feeling like that there was a lot to be scared of and then I kind of forced myself to to not think that way cuz I don't know it's short and I don't want to be scared <laughs> so even if I feel that way I just want to pretend I'm not you know was there a, a defining moment where you just said screw it I'm not gonna live in fear anymore I think there's always been sort of a instinct that I have to to try to get out from under shadows and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of an instinct I have for probably obvious reasons. Yeah. So I don't know. I guess, you know, my father died when I was real young and I had a problem with alcohol for a long time. And I think at some point I was just kind of like, you know what, it's too... It's too short, like I'm already 44 years old and I feel like I'm running out of time, <laughs> <laughs> which is weird, but I think it all kind of plays into that idea of, you know, I, I was initially afraid of everything, so I kind of was scared for a long time in my life and then I was like, wait a second, I got to change that up, so I feel like I lost a lot of time. That noise you hear overhead is the uh, crowds of people flying into Palm Springs yeah. International Airport. Yeah. They're coming in like the bucket load this week. Yeah. From Arnism week. Yeah. It's so exciting. I it really is. It. I love being around this this time. Now, it's did so you cool. spend much time in Palm Springs growing up? I did, yeah. I mean, I grew up in L.A., but we were down here all the time. I mean, it's not that far. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time down here. Was this like a weekend place, or did you actually spend, like, long stretches here? No, like, more like, you know, during a holiday break for, like, a week or two or something. And, you know, definitely any school breaks and stuff. We were down here for sure. So I, I love it down here. It's like, I love it. It's the greatest. Uh, it is the greatest, isn't it? Yeah, and you all have a working hot tub. My hot tub at my house broke. The water oh. The water broke. So it's a red emergency. I'm jealous. So you said you're 44 now. Yes. But you started your music career fairly late in life, right? When was that? Well, I, I started singing pretty late. Singing but I late. was I was a, a bass player for a long time and a drummer for a long time. And then I just sort of... I, so I was in other people's bands playing other people's music. And then I started teaching music to little kids, like a baby's kind of mommy and me kind yeah. of class. Um, and, you know, it required a lot of singing and stuff. So I just was like, you know what? I haven't... I haven't focused on singing, like, really. And I just started doing it seriously maybe the past, like, four years I started really doing it. So, yeah, that part has been really late, for sure. So finally making a record that's mine took a really long time. And and when did you figure out, like, hey, I, I got a voice, I should really cut an album? Um, around that time, <laughs> I just, I, 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 a lot of stuff changed about three, four years ago. I, uh, I had had my kid and my marriage broke up and I had gotten sober and like all kinds of stuff where I actually felt like I could do something that was not going to be terrible because I wasn't good at it and I wasn't, I didn't have anything to say because that was kind of how it was for a long time. I thought, I was just like, well, I don't have anything I want to put out because I don't, who cares, right? Sure. And then I felt like, oh, okay, now it's, I have like a decent enough voice to kind of give new interpretation to some of this music that I really care about, because that's what that record is to me. And, and everything going forward is going to be that too. <laughs> and there's a wealth of material that can just keep going forever. For a and long ever, time. And ever, yeah. I remember I, I met your uncle. Oh, yeah. About um, 10 years ago. And one of the things that I chatted with him about, which I had only found out, like, I guess it was the month before he was interested in, was military history. Yeah. He was super into it. And he knew a lot about it. Like, he, he was, he knew, he had, like, a few things like that that he was so into, like, that stuff, just aviation in general, he was really into. 
He also knew all the um, F-Series fighter jets, yep. you know, by number and, yep. and why the F-15 was different than the F-20 yep. was, you know. He was really, really encyclopedic about a lot of stuff. It was great to just hear him just talk about stuff he was interested in because no matter what it was, it was like he had a way of making it interesting, you yeah. know. So did he have kids? Did you have cousins? Yeah, okay. so he has a kid named Mike who's my cousin and okay. he's great and he's got a kid now he's got two now so i have my daughter has her cousins and stuff it's great that's a really really sweet family i only wish that my uncle could have met him because they never he never met his Aww. grandkids yeah hey, he died fairly young he really, really did he was 73 yeah. yeah just really i'm sorry 72 and it was it was real sudden and sad yeah about your mom yeah I think it's it's always interesting uh, when somebody's mom poses for Playboy. But what was That's more interesting... That's one word you could use. But what was more interesting to me is, I understand you shot a documentary about it? Yeah. Tell me about this documentary, because I've not seen it on Netflix yet. No, no, no. <laughs> it, was, it was a documentary film class that I was taking. Okay. And one of the projects was, I went to film school, and I was in that class, and it corresponded with the time that that happened, and it just seemed like an, it was a way for me to kind of, like, organize my thoughts about that whole thing, and she was doing a lot at the time, so I thought it was really interesting. Yeah. And the really interesting bit about it was that in that class and in all the classes I had at that school, I, I went to school for writing movies and their program was so that, uh, made it so that you couldn't make a film with dialogue because they wanted you to make sure that you could tell a story cinematically, visually, not, yeah. not just, you know, writing dialogue and talking. So, uh, I thought that was really cool. So the thing I had to do for that film I made for my class was I had to shoot it, and, and you had to shoot it on film, and you could only narrate. You couldn't do interviews, you couldn't do that kind of stuff. So it was all very much from my point of view about, like, what was going on. And My mom is in Playboy. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, it, was, it wasn't, like, that personal. But for me, just doing it as a very sort of fact-based, like, here she is going to this thing, and here she is, you know, getting ready to do it. And it was not just that. I mean, it was like going to rehearsals and going to interview. It was just kind of following her around and seeing what it was like to sort of stage a comeback and all that stuff that was happening for her at that time, which was great. I mean, it was really positive for her and she was doing great and people loved the record and she was touring. Like, so I just, I wanted to not let myself kind of get sucked into the personal thing about that because it's like okay well that kind of goes without saying that's gonna yeah. be weird yeah. for a kid even though i was an adult and i supported it like obviously it's like okay and she's a grown person i'm a grown person it's like it's not, you know it's okay it's fine but it was just a way to kind of to oh, sort of distance myself from it a little bit and mm -hmm. be more objective about it and not let my opinion get into it yeah you know this documentary, is this on YouTube somewhere? Can people no, see it? No, I don't know what happened to it. It was like a project I did. Like I said, I shot it on Super 8. And... Oh, man. You should yeah. dig around for that. I put it on a videotape. We had My boyfriend at the time had a big blank wall, and we just projected it on the wall and shot it on a camcorder. So we had it on tape somewhere, but I don't know what happened to it. Well, yeah. if you find it, let us know. I will. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been in the L.A. area most of your life, although I think you spent some time in a little town called Hackensack? No, it was another little town with an H in New Jersey. Which one? Hoboken. Hoboken, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Hoboken, home of Buddy's Bakery, that yeah. famous one that's on the cable. Carlos. Carlos. It's actually called Carlos. Carlos. Yeah, which is terrible. Oh, it's like sorry not, to hear that. It's not a great... I don't know. People would get their cakes from that place before that all happened, and it's like, oh, it's fine. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. How long were you there? I was there, and not because of the reason people think, which yeah. is kind of funny. Um, I got into that because I lived in New York, and I, uh, the guy who I was working with at the time to make my records, because I had a little label, and he and I were putting out 
45s and stuff. He worked with a studio that was in Hoboken. And I went to the studio to kind of meet the people who worked there. And, you know, I got to see what they were doing out there. And I really liked it. And at the time, it was relatively cheaper than New York. Mm -hmm. So I moved out there because of that. And it just so happened that it was familiarly linked now were you in the bands at that same time too yeah okay. so i was in a couple different bands while i was there okay mm -hmm. any bands that we would have heard of no <laughs> you just played the local club circuit uh something like that yeah yeah um people listening to this might have heard of a band called dinosaur jr i don't know but okay. uh, i played in a band with the drummer from that band that's about as famous Dinosaur as Dinosaur Jr.? Gets. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll have to Google that one. Yeah. <laughs> you never know. There might be hidden architectural dino fans. <laughs> I don't know. As you were out here in, in Palm Springs doing all this, what was it like to have people know your connection with your grandfather? Was it something that was sort of present all the time or just at certain times people like really wanted to glom onto it? or? I guess it's certain times. Yeah. Because I don't... It's not the kind of thing that comes up. It's just in conversation. I, no, I mean, and then people find out, and it's like, oh, you're blah, and then they treat you different. Yeah. So I try not to talk about it unless I'm asked. Yeah. Because what am I going to say? Like, hey, I'm so and so. <laughs> it's like if it comes up, great. It's just it's by dint of DNA. You know what I mean? I always feel like I'm a specimen. Yeah. It's like I just have the same molecules of dna and stuff i'm I, I don't know what to say it's like i'm happy about it i'm honored yeah but i'm not i think they come up to me and they feel like being close to the molecule or something so, so they how like do people that. how do people treat you differently when they know i guess like i'm saying they feel like tearing a piece of, of someone's shirt oh yeah and it's like oh there's the like piece. i got I'm paul the mccartney's the shirt yeah. and the sweat in the bottle yeah that's what it's like I started looking into this, and it seems like there are a bunch of shows on, on Sirius and mm -hmm. even on some FM, AM and FM stations back in the East mm -hmm. that are just dedicated to your grandfather's music 24-7. Sure. I yep. mean, a lot of those. Mm -hmm. that, that's, wow, that's crazy. I don't know any other musician that really has that going on for them. Yeah, um, I don't know. Maybe Tony Bennett or maybe, someone? I don't maybe. know. Are you still hosting on Sirius? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. How often do you do that? It's once a month. Once a month. I'm okay. on there the last uh, Friday of the month. Yeah. And, and what kind of music do you play? I play his music, but I also... So the whole idea of the show is that, you know, I try to find music that I think is either... To me, to my ear, like of a piece with that stuff, not necessarily instrumentation, but like in good songwriting, good singing, um, interpretation. Like to me, there's a way to sort of find commonality between that style of music and other styles of music. So I try to show that on the show. So you're really curating it in a kind of high Yeah, way. and that's kind of the way the record evolved was from that idea. So I think the record is kind of along that same line of the songs from that record are kind of all over the place and yet to me they seem like a cohesive record in the sound that we did for the album it's all you know they all managed to sound like one record even though you know there's stuff written in the 30s and 40s paired with things that were written you know a couple years ago so that's kind of my whole goal is to show that it can all just be good music sure yeah now do you play any of your own tracks on the show um i try not to do that it just feels they're waiting for me to do something like that you know they are. Like, oh, well who knows i don't know because i know Maybe. you you've been singing some of your grandfather's songs yeah and... and there's a few on the record too yeah 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 i mean i feel like those are things the things that i choose to sing of those are things that i feel like i can sing and do in a way that's different you know i'm not doing michael buble style doing it same way right i just a because i can't uh but that's also why i don't sing songs like you know come fly with me and 
it doesn't make sense for me as a singer to do sure. that. So that's why I do all the heartbreak, horrible, you know, down songs. <laughs> that's that's more my speed. <laughs> so, yeah. So, like, I'll do a show that is just me and a piano, and it's the entire In the We Small Hours album, or I'll do it with the entire Only the Lonely album. Because, you know, when my uncle died, I kind of felt like... I, I had just started doing my own shows with this stuff, kind of a cabaret-style thing, with the, a lot of the songs that are on the record. Uh, and then there was an idea that, you know, he was going to, my uncle was going to do a kind of like a tribute-style show right before he died. And everybody was like, oh, do you, you know, now that you're singing, do you want to take that on? And I looked at it and I said, you know, I just think it would be cynical and kind of just not correct for me to do that but this is what I can do I can do these album shows and you know to try to kind of keep it going in some way you know but that's kind of all I can do and like this show tomorrow night I was given a list of all these songs that they wanted me to do and I was like you know I can do a lot of these, but some of them they're gonna have to do as a band because I'm not singing love and marriage and I'm not singing yeah come fly with me it just it just yeah. doesn't work it doesn't make sense like is there so. a is there one of the songs that's maybe not one of the major anthems that you really like oh yeah, yeah tell mean, me about tons some of those of them i mean those two whole albums i okay. just mentioned are top to bottom like some of my favorite songs ever not just him just mm -hmm. like songs ever you know and he looked at it like that too like when he made the in the we small hours record it was very much like curated by him going through like old, old music. Some of it is super, super old. And he went through and curated stuff that he thought would tell a story that he wanted to tell. And so that's where he and I are similar. I don't have his voice. I don't have, you know, and I'm a woman and I'm, I've got a different set style and sensibility. But in that, that's where I hope to kind of carry on a tradition of interpretation and doing that. So that's where we're alike. Are there other cousins or cousins' children who are going to pick up singing some of these tunes? That I, you don't know? Know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. You'll be interviewing them maybe in, <laughs> in 10 20 years. years. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> don't know. So far, no. So where can people get your album? Uh, it is on all the platforms like Spotify and iTunes and uh, some local record shops as well, depending on where you live. Because there's a very limited vinyl okay. release as well. So it's on vinyl. Is mm -hmm. it on CD? No. Okay. Didn't bother. I don't have the money. Okay. I had to pick. <laughs> yeah. One or the other. <laughs> Which one? Our secret word for today, if you haven't guessed this already, is Sinatra. AJ is Frank Sinatra's granddaughter, that which would be Frank Sinatra Jr.'s niece. Yep. Right? Yep. Yep. And that would make you like... Tina Sinatra's niece mm -hmm. on the other side. Mm -hmm. So you've maybe stumped, we've stumped you all guys today. But thank you so much, thank AJ, you. for coming thank by and chatting with me. Thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Thanks. And now a song from her new album, Careful You. Here's AJ Lambert with Sleep Warm.
Next, from the routinely noisy atrium at the Hyatt Palm Springs, George interviews Palm Springs musicians Joan and Gary Gand of the Gand Band. When you come to Palm Springs, it's easy to fall in love with the architecture, but people are also playing some kind of music on their iPhones or in their cars, and more often than not, that music harkens back a little bit in time. What kind of music do you guys like, and what reminds you of Palm Springs when you're playing? We love music from the era of mid-century modern. We love the architecture of mid-century modern. We love the instruments of mid-century modern. And by that, we mean the era of the 50s through the 70s. And we happen to have grown up during that era, so it's part of our psyche, it's part of our personality to love that music and know the music. Uh, but to be able to perform that music for people and, and communicate the spirit of that music to people is what's really exciting and what we love to do as musicians. When you come to Palm Springs, the first thing that happens is you start thinking Rat Pack, which would be... For those of you that don't know who the Rat Pack well, was, I'm let's going tell there. them. Okay. Yeah, the Rat Pack was Frank Sinatra's cronies. Frank Sinatra lived in Palm Springs, built one of the first uh, mid-century modern houses in Palm Springs, which kind of set the tone for America because Sinatra at the time after uh, the Second World War was a, you know, a major influence on, on, on culture. For young people it's hard to understand how popular a singer of that time could be but it would be like Justin Bieber is now or Beyonce or somebody of that caliber. You know, Frank Sinatra would walk down the street and girls would go crazy and run after him and chase him. Right, and he did walk down the streets of Palm Springs because he built a house here and, and then built a second home here. So he's so much a part of the fabric of Palm Springs. And when we came out here from Chicago, where we were born and raised and, and brought up on Chicago blues, we got here to the desert and all the music was basically Frank Sinatra-esque, crooner, lounge type music. And we big bands, big sounds. Right. We, well, but, and but, small trios and yeah, it, singers, a lot of singers. Yeah, actually, uh, n no big bands in town. Uh, what we would hear being performed live in town would be what's called the American Songbook, which would be songs from the Second World War, but done in a trio style, or usually because of the budgets out here, would be a piano player. It would be a piano player that was singing or a piano player accompanying a singer and that was it there wasn't really any any bands there were no big bands there were no small bands there weren't any bands there were just piano players and crooners and that's fine you know and there was a lot of computers being used to generate the backgrounds for these singers yeah. really everywhere yeah. we would go it would be a singer with a computer yeah and they were doing that for financial reasons you know yeah. budgets were tight to hire live music and when we first came out to Palm Springs 16 years ago, things were not as jumping as they are today. No, no. So we got excited about the idea of bringing a full-on live band experience to Palm Springs because we had played in bands in Chicago. We own a music business in Chicago. We grew up on blues and soul music. We love that type of music, and nobody was really doing that type of music here. And we thought, well, let's bring a little bit of sort of Chicago modernism. Rooted little Mies van der Rohe. A yep. little yeah. Mies van der Rohe, a little Frank Lloyd Wright, a little bit of the architects inspired by those two who came after that, like Keck and Keck. Ed Dart. Ed Dart. And, Humrick. Uh, Ed Humrick. Humrick. Yeah. There's a number of architects well, that came know, after. Yeah, Bertrand Goldberg, who did Marina City and uh, Astor Tower. So what we did is we, we brought our Chicago... We call it Chicago Bauhaus and Beyond is the preservation group we founded in Chicago. And so we wanted to bring some of that vibe here to the desert. And a lot of people in the desert here are from Chicago. Uh, sure. So for the same reasons that we are, because it's bloody cold there. So right. uh, One of our most requested songs is Sweet Home Chicago. <laughs> really? Right, right. Yes. Yes. Every time yes. there's people from Chicago... We Made played. popular by the Blues Brothers? Yes. Well, and yes. before that by Lonnie Brooks, who had okay. the original hit with it. And it was written originally by Robert Johnson back in the 30s. So we take Mies van der Rohe and Keck and Keck, and we mix it with Muddy Waters and Buddy Guy, and uh, you get the so Gan So who band. sings the Jake and Elwood blues parts in that song? <laughs> Not us. <laughs> right, right. We have a fabulous frontman singer named Dion Kahn. Yeah. He sings all of that okay. and more. 
and he is originally from Ohio, yes. made his way out to California, and now he's here and he sings fantastic soul music, even though he's a much younger person than we are. He has got an old soul, and he just brings a great contemporary sound to it. And he grew up listening to Tina Turner. So oh, that's, nice. That's, uh, that's, that's his, his reference. Right. So everybody has somebody they listen to. Uh, I, of course, listen to Buddy Guy, being from Chicago. And uh, Joan listened to Ramsey Lewis. So One of the it. fun things that we got to do back in Chicago was we're active with the Chicago Architecture Foundation, which sure. is now called the Chicago Architecture Center. They just built this amazing new building. And they have a, a museum and a... And the boat tours, of course. And the boat right. tours and a fantastic event hall that we got to help design and do the sound for. And when we were helping them raise money, they had a big gala, and we performed for the gala with B.B. King's daughter, Shirley King, singing with us. Wow. And it was just fantastic, and they loved it. So we brought her out to Palm Springs several times also to entertain people here. But now we pretty much have our groove with the Gan Band, and we have our interesting mix of songs. I play vintage organ, Hammond B3. A Hammond B3. I read about that. Yeah. Invented in Chicago. Right. Another Chicago connection. And, and that was, that had a spillover not just from the crooning uh, songs, but also into a lot of the rock and roll music of the 60s. And yes. And that Hammond organ in the background. The Monkees, I think they had one in a lot of their songs. Yeah, the Monkees did. And uh, the Dave Clark Five was organ heavy. Beach and Boys. Beach Boys, Steve Winwood. Uh, you know, it just keeps going. Deep Purple. Going, right, Deep Purple <laughs> made the organ famous. I, myself, listen to Booker T. Booker T and the MGs is one of my favorites. And... You know, playing organ is something, again, you don't hear in a local band. No. You just don't hear it being done. So people hear the sound. We play outside quite often because it's Palm Springs. We could do that. Not like Chicago. So in the winter, we can play outside. People will hear it at a distance, and they'll be attracted to the sound. What is that organ? It sounds like a real Hammond B3. Let's go see what it is. And then Gary brings some of his vintage guitar collection. And some of the guitars he plays are really interesting and have a great sound to them. Yeah, I have a lot of stuff from, again, from the golden age of guitars, which was the late 50s and early 60s. So I have uh, Stratocaster number 163, which was built in 1954, the first year of the Fender Stratocaster. And then one I have is the 163rd one they ever built. And I have uh, Les Paul Sunburst from 1959-1960. I have a 1959 Gibson Flying V, like you would see Albert King playing. All of the classics have a Firebird, like the one that Holland Wolf used to play. And we've collected instruments for years, and that collecting mentality, when we got interested in modernism in 1986, we bought a house in Chicago by Keck and Keck, and they had taught at the Bauhaus, the Institute of Design in Chicago. They became very influential. They created and invented passive solar design, and well, a lot of architects make that claim. Right, but they they've got the proof. <laughs> okay, yeah, and we live in the proof. Yeah, well, they started in Chicago. Yeah, they started at the World's Fair in Chicago in 1936, and uh, they were the first architects to use thermal pane windows. And they discovered passive solar yeah. by accident yeah. because they built a house with lots of windows there, and it, when it's the called the glass house, we're building it in the winter. It was hot in there. And they were the ones that had the idea, wow, if we could actually orient the house correctly, we could capture this heat. So it did start with Keck and Keck at the Chicago World's Fair in 1936. And then we moved into that house. Our life changed. Design changed the way we wanted to live. We were already collecting vintage instruments. Then we had to collect vintage furniture, vintage art, vintage objects. Cut yourself an Eames chair, in right? In the house, yeah. absolutely. Got the Eames chair from your got mom. The Knoll furniture, mm -hmm. Herman Miller, George Nelson, all the names. You know the way we used to know Gibson and Fender and Hammond. We started to learn all the names of the great designers right, it became, of that era. Became Norman Turner and uh, Warren Plattner and Florence Knoll, who just passed away last week yes, at the did. age of a hundred. Yeah, good run, good run, very good run. Changing the way we all sit. 
So there's a, a lot of similarities between musical instrument collectors, musicians, and modernists. But when you moved here, you also got a modernist house here. Tell us about that. We did. Or actually, we have had two houses here. The first one was one of the A-frame Alexander houses. Some people call them Swiss Misses. We're coining a new term now called a low house. A -L -O -H -A -U -S, a low house. H-A-U-S. Okay. Because <clears throat> it has been discovered that the architect was influenced by tropical architecture, not Swiss architecture. <laughs> right, not hot so, chocolate. <laughs> so he was uh, a fan of Hawaiian architecture and lived in Hawaii. Right, Charles, Charles Dubois yeah. was his name, yeah. So the Swiss Miss was designed by Dubois in the Hawaiian style. But after 10 years in that house, which we loved, we discovered a more amazing house, and we felt after seeing it, we better buy it and preserve it because it was so original and so amazing, and we just thought, if this falls into the wrong hands, somebody could say, oh, rip out that swim-up bar, you know, that's old. Let's, yeah. not, let's not keep that. Those original bar chairs, let's throw those away and get something new. That tiny little kitchen, you know, let's break down those walls and make it an open kitchen. Well, we've kept everything original. Well, thank you. I mean, there are not a lot of people that would do that. And our, our current house was designed originally by William Kreisel, but then expanded, enlarged, and reimagined by Hal Levitt, Harold Hal Levitt from L.A. And it's quite a house. It has lots of angles and interesting design and lots of terrazzo. Oh, terrazzo is wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So the terrazzo starts at the street, and there's a limo-sized sidewalk, so when you get out of your limousine you, on terrazzo, you walk up a terrazzo staircase into the house, you walk down a 30-foot terrazzo hallway into a sunken living room, which is all terrazzo, and then you walk up to a sunken bar, which is all terrazzo. Wow. And then the glass walls behind the bar and on either end of the living room open up and slide into the walls and disappear completely, so you can literally walk into the pool from the living room, swim around for a while, and then swim over to the bar and have your cocktail which is Palm Springs, 100%. Right, right. And it's called the Morse House. M -O -R -S -E. The Morse House. M-O-R-S-E. So people, you can Google it and see photos of it. So if you want to enjoy some great images. What a great house to have. I mean, I think you, you had me at Swim Up Bar. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also hashtag Morse for all you Instagram folks. And Claire Morse, whose idea it was to bring in Hal Levitt, was from Chicago. So here we go again. There you go. There's so many connections between Chicago and Palm Springs. Arthur Elrod, who is being honored at this Modernism yes, show. Yes, getting a star on the Walk right, of Fame. Getting a star today. Did some amazing commissions in Chicago, which we have not seen in person, but the pictures survive and are in Adele Seigelman's amazing book. In particular, the Johnson Publications Building was the home of Ebony Magazine. Sure. And yeah. back in the day, they built a building on Michigan Avenue, the only black-owned business high-rise on Michigan Avenue, designed by a black architect, Decor, by Arthur Elrod and Associates. From Palm Springs. And they created the most amazing interiors. I'm going to have to look that building up. Yeah, yeah it's it's incredible. And it's there's some pictures in Adele's book. Okay. You'll see. Okay. And the kitchen from that building, because the building has now been sold and is being dismantled, the kitchen, which is phenomenal beyond belief, it's more than a kitchen, it's sort of a cultural artifact, has been saved by Landmarks Illinois. They documented it. They took it apart piece by piece. They have it in storage, and now they're making it available to any museum or organization that has the space that wants to display it. They can submit their proposal to Landmarks Illinois. Well, you know, Palm Springs is becoming a center of that kind of thing, with the Walker Guest House being here for a while now, and the uh, Luminaire House. Right. right, right. So we're hoping maybe someone somewhere in Palm Springs will want to get the Arthur Elrod kitchen back Back here back to Palm here. Springs. Yes, right, it belongs right. here. Well, I know the Johnson daughter lives here. We'll maybe she'll happens. want to start cooking again. Yeah, <laughs> right. 
Well, thank you so much for okay. joining me, yeah. and I, I hope one day to uh, be swimming up to your bar. <laughs> that sounds like the most exciting house yeah. ever. I come, think we need to make that happen, yes. for sure. Come, come in, back when it's a little yeah, warmer. Come back in May when, <laughs> when, the, when the pool's warm. <laughs> right. Thank you so right. much. Thanks. Thanks. And now with one of their most requested songs, Sweet Home Chicago, it's the Gan Band. All right, here we go. <laughs>
Thanks for listening. Want to hang out with U.S. Modernist at Modernism Week in February next year? Send an email to george at usmodernist.org with your name and phone number. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Angela Roll, your special agent for Modernist Houses. 919-995-0550. Okay, take us out, Tom. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 7,000 significant modernist houses, and access two and a half million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Cindy Stratton, not her real name, researches guests from her secret underground lair. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George, and I'll be back soon with another Modernism Week edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. Modernist Radio.